you can turn to Matthew 3, if you wish, I mean, Matthew 3, um, Matthew 23, if you wish. I'll be reading from that in a few minutes. <clears throat> we're also, if you have a catechism, uh, we're looking at question um, 55 today. And if you have the, um, the outline that I sent out to you, then you can also look at that. So um, we're, we're doing the shorter catechism now, of course, and we're looking at the third commandment. This commandment is the subject of, um, I believe it's four questions in the catechism, question 53 through 56. So we have covered um, the, the first 53, 54, and the, those two, and then we're doing 55 today. So let's begin, though, by, que- by confessing the first one, question 53. Question 53 says, which is the third commandment? The third commandment is, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, in our introductory message two times ago, we looked at the basic meaning of this commandment. And I mentioned to you that people don't understand what it means to take God's name in vain very well. They think it's just forbidding us to use God's name as a curse word. And it certainly does include that. But I showed you that when it speaks of God's name, it includes everything that is revealed about God. Your name is your identification how you are known to others, or how you, we might say, how you are revealed to them, how you are described and thought of. Your name is sometimes used as a substitute for your reputation, a substitute word for reputation, like a person that has a good name or a bad name. It refers to their reputation. And taking God's name means that you do something with God's name. You take his name when you speak about it, when you think about it, when you do something in his name or that is associated with his name, when you represent him in some way in what you're doing. If someone is talking about you or thinking about you, then they take your name into their thoughts. They think about you or they take their name in speaking of you. And they can take your name as something that's worthless, or they can take it as something that they honor. If you have people who work for your company, they take your name in that their actions represent you. For example, a wonderful waitress at Swiss Chalet helps to give Swiss Chalet a good name. If you go there and you have terrible waitresses five times in a row, then they get a bad name and you tell people, oh, I wouldn't go there. Uh, They get the orders wrong and whatever. But you take God's name in vain when you do not treat his name then as honorable. When you speak of him in a way that's unworthy of his glory, when you think of him as unimportant, worthless, or a do-nothing God, like Baal, or when you do something that is unworthy of his name, like the bad waitress at uh, Swiss Chalet takes their name in vain by her bad service. She abuses the name. So we can abuse God's name as Christians. So you see, this, this is a very encompassing concept here in the third commandment. It, it includes so much. Last week, we took up question 54, and this one talks about what's required in the third commandment. And let me just say something to you again to remind you where we have things that are required and things that are forbidden on every single commandment. You say, well, it just, it just has something forbidden. It says don't take God's name in vain. Well, yes, it does. It's forbidden. But there's an implication because these are summary commandments. They come from God. And we like to have like 500 rules all listed out. But the Hebrews don't do it that way. And God doesn't do it that way in the Word. He gives us these one commandment and stated negatively that doesn't mean it doesn't have a positive meaning and all kinds of applications that you could write lots and lots of other commandments under it. And so every time we have where something like this is forbidden, it has an opposite or requirement as well. So question 54, let's confess this together. It asks, what is required 
in the third commandment. The third commandment requireth the holy and reverent use of God's names, titles, attributes, ordinances, word, and works. So in looking at this, we saw how that we ought to have the highest regard for God's name. Not just negatively, not to take it in vain, but also positively to highly regard it. We need to keep before us his majesty and glory so that when we think of him, even when we think of him or when we speak about him, we do so with the utmost respect. We want to represent him and to think of him as he truly is, the high and holy one who inhabits eternity, whose glory fills all things, who has all authority in heaven and earth. This week, we're going to look at question 55, which has to do with the sins prohibited, forbidden in the third commandment. So let's confess question 55 together. Question 55, what is forbidden in the third commandment? The third commandment forbiddeth all profaning or abusing of anything whereby God maketh himself known. This shows us that we take God's name in vain when we profane it or abuse it. So let's talk about that. Profaning means that you treat something holy as if it were ordinary. In other words, you act as if God's name and all that is revealed about him is just like any common name, just, just ordinary, which means that you act as if God is just an ordinary being rather than God. And you abuse his name when you bring harm to it in some way, when you damage his reputation. You know what it is to have your name abused. For example, if someone says that you are untrustworthy, then they're attacking your name, aren't they? They abuse what is known about you, your reputation. People do that with God all the time, don't they? We'll be looking at that in more detail as we go on here. This is just summarizing as we prepare for our scripture reading. Today we're going to look at some of the ways that people profane or abuse his name. And for our scripture reading, I've chosen Matthew 23. In this account, we have where some of the people that were thought of as the most spiritual, dedicated people in the world to God were taking God's name in vain. And Jesus exposes this. So for our scripture reading, it's Matthew 23. These scribes and Pharisees who ministered in God's name dishonored God's name. So you can minister in God's name and dishonor his name. Problem was not that they did not represent God. That's their problem. It would have been better if they'd been representing someone else other than God. The very <laughs> fact that they were representing God wrongly is what made it all the more offensive. So listen now as I read to you from God's holy word. This is Matthew 23, and I'll read the first 36 verses. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to the disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear, and they lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad, and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best feasts, the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing, and whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gifts? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Let me just pause there for a minute. You see, they were trying to, they tried to get out of their O's by having Okay, if we swear by this, then it, it, it's not really God's name. And if we swear by this, it is God's name. It sounds like God's name to people that we're swearing to, but it's not really God's name. So then we don't have to take that one seriously. And uh, they were actually greatly profaning God's name by doing that. Because, see, they were associating, what, even though they said, we don't think so. Other people thought so. So they were bringing God's name into the thing and dishonoring him. Okay, he goes on, verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and come in and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of their righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt, serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, for the blood of the righteous, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. May the Lord bless to us the reading of his holy word. The scribes and Pharisees represented God, but they did not truly love God. They presented or pretended to have a very high regard of his name, but it was just a show. One of the reasons it is such an awful thing to take God's name in vain is because when you take anyone's name, including God's, now, now think about this, you have a lot of power at your disposal. You have power over someone's name and reputation when you take their name. That's why you see what little tyrants we are, because you take hold of someone's name and you can do whatever you want with it. If you have to go and uh, fight them physically, then you're, you're more afraid. Uh, but if, if you can just take their name and they're not around, and then you can do whatever you want with it. You've got power over their name. Uh, you can represent God as cruel. Or you can suggest that God doesn't even exist. That's taking God's name in vain for sure. You, you can think of him in your little mind as one who is unfair. And you can go about all day long grumbling and saying, God is not fair to me. He's not treating me right. You're taking God's name in vain. He's not just, in other words. And with your little mouth, your little, little pitiful mouth, you can take the name of the Most High God and you can curse Him. And you can say that He approves of things that He doesn't approve of. And that He hates things that He does not hate. And you can be like these scribes and Pharisees who represent God as one who is more concerned about tithing herbs 
than he was about loving your neighbor. And you give a distorted picture of God because you would rather tithe your herbs than love your neighbor. You can do all of these things. God leaves people with the power to go ahead and profane and abuse his name. Now, of course, the day of reckoning is going to come. You'll be judged for every word that came out of your mouth, even every idle word. But for the time being, he lets you go ahead and strike at his name. You ought to never dream, even dream of doing such a thing, of attacking God's name, because it will come back on you. Yeah, you can do it easy. There's no, nothing, to, nothing in your way. Just throw out all the, except your fear and realization that he sees it and that he will deal with it. Now, next week, we're going to look at how that we can't get away with profaning his name. Because this is, this is one of the easiest ones that you can do that you can get away, think you can get away with. You can get away with it for a while. Abusing God's name for many, many years. But God will not forget that. But for the remainder of our time this week, I want to call you to, in God's name, from the sins of the third commandment. So let's look at what these are. First, you must not profane and abuse his name by claiming that he has said things that he never said, that he did not say. Now, surely you all know what this is like, to have someone accuse you of saying something that you didn't even say and that you wouldn't even say. You've probably had that. Well, you said, and it's like, I, I never even thought that. You know, how did you get that? It gives people a false impression about you, and it damages your name. Perhaps you have had this happen. Maybe when you were in school and some girl tells your, tells your friend that you said that you can't stand to be around her when all you did was mention that she did something that really annoyed you and you presented that to, to her and to other people that you can't stand to be around her and then she's acting awkward around you and you find out later. Or maybe as an adult, they tell people that they heard you say that your spouse was an idiot when you didn't. Maybe you were kind of complaining about something, but you didn't say they were an idiot, and then that gets around. Or maybe they tell the other people at work that you said that you were the only person at work who was good enough to go to heaven. <laughs> I bet that's happened, because you, you witness to them and you say that, we have to, that I'm a, a wretched sinner, and the only way I can get to heaven is trusting in Jesus Christ, and I'm going to go to heaven because I trusted in Jesus Christ. And they interpret that, that you said, I'm the only one here that's good enough to go to heaven. <laughs> and they're taking your name in vain in that case. <laughs> you have a lot of power to damage a name. But it seems that people do this to God even more than they do it to each other. You hear preachers telling people that God says that he loves everyone and will never send anyone to hell. God never said that. Or you have a woman, women who say that, I just know in my heart God has called me into the ministry. No, he didn't. God doesn't call women to, into the ministry of, I'm talking about, of course, the ministry of word and uh, sacrament. He doesn't do that. That's how in even one of our, what used to be, this sister denomination of ours that we were in fraternal relations with, we're not anymore because of some of these things. But how they, when they began to have women ordained, the, the guy that was uh, president of the college, I think it was, or something like that, he said, my, my daughter said that God has called her to the ministry. Like she's been calling her, and how could I say no to her? It's like, well, who says no? It's God that said no. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul tells Timothy to preach the word because there will be pressure on him to preach something else, to take God's name in vain. Listen to what he says. 1 Timothy 4, 3. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So then they have, but everybody says whatever heresy it is. All the preachers say whatever the heresy is. And so then there's pressure on the one who's still speaking the truth to conform to the others. Jeremiah had a terrible time about that when he was a prophet. I mean, I don't mean that he failed at it, but he had pressure. As a true prophet of God, he was telling the people what God had said, revealed to him as a prophet, that the Lord was going to destroy Jerusalem and carry them away into exile. 
But there are all these other prophets, lots of other prophets, and they claim to be prophets of the Lord. And the, the majority of them, and they were saying that God would never destroy his holy city. He's promised to preserve and keep his people. He's not going to do that. And Jeremiah was this guy that was saying he was. They accused Jeremiah of being the one who was attributing words to God that God would never say. And they tried to have Jeremiah killed several times. He was the one that's speaking the truth. That's the reason that these other prophets, they're not in our, in our Bible. There's not, a, pro, there's not a, a book of the Bible with their name on it. Because all their prophecies were lies and they failed. They did go into exile. So whose book got in the Bible? Jeremiah's. Because it was from the Lord. When they did this, you see, and when preachers and individuals do this today, what are they doing? They're profaning and abusing God's holy name. They give people a false impression about God. It's a very reprehensible thing to do. Things have not changed much since Jeremiah's day, have they? Sometimes the things that are said are different, but there are so many false teachers. And let me add to this, be very careful about the Pentecostal movement. Now, let me say first, there are some wonderful brothers and sisters in this movement, but very often, they take prophecy very lightly. They're always saying, God told me to do this or that, or that God said something, when, it, when it's not really prophecy, but their own impression of what they think God wants. Maybe they, you know, they, they had too many anchovies on their pizza or something, and they had a, a thought that came in their mind or something. But very, very often, they get things wrong. And, and then when they get it wrong, it's not a big deal. If you're claiming that God said something and it's not what he said, it is a big deal. And that's the problem. God is holy and we're not to mess around with his word. He has given us the Holy Scripture today and the Scripture is complete. Don't go about looking for modern day prophecies. Such prophecies are profane. Stick to God's word. You have all that you need there. I remember as a young Christian being a bit confused when I was listening to, I, I, I saw, oh, a Christian station on TV, you know, and the guys were talking and they were doing a prophecy about some great destruction that was going to come to the world. And the guy that was supposed to be the prophet said, now I hope I'm wrong about this, but I got this from the Lord and the prophet, and he started naming the prophecy. And I, was, I was a new Christian, but I knew what God's word was. And I thought, I hope I'm wrong. He's a prophet. Like, he's trying to, I wasn't quite sure how to process all that. Okay, well now let's look at another way that we must not abuse or profane God's name. Second thing, you must not associate God's name with lies when you swear an oath or take a vow. You know, when you swear to tell the truth in a court of law or when you take wedding vows or membership vows, you need to realize what you're actually doing. You are swearing in God's name. You are taking God's name. And as the third commandment says, you ought to never take it in vain. You're calling God to bear witness that you are telling the truth or that you will keep your promise. You are saying that God who sees and knows all things, including your heart, is your witness. That he knows, that God knows and bears witness that you are telling the truth. My friend, if you're not telling the truth or if you're making a false promise, it's a very serious offense. You are associating God's name with your lie and you are actually asking him to curse you if it's not true. You're asking him to hold you accountable for what you're saying. As Leviticus 19.12 puts it, you profane his holy name when you do that. Leviticus 19, 12, and you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. But don't misunderstand something. God is pleased for you to use his name to bear witness to what you're saying in important matters. In fact, he commands that you take oaths in his name. Did you notice the command? Deuteronomy 6, 13, he says, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. Now, you think about that. 
if you don't take any oaths in God's name, you're suggesting that there's no one who can witness to what you're saying that has authority to do that. So it's, it's actually an offense if in important things you don't take an oath in God's name or, or vow. He has a couple of reasons here for commanding this. First, because he does not want you to swear in anyone else's name. To do so is to attribute to that one in whose name you swear what belongs only to God. Only God can see your heart. Only he can affirm that you're telling the truth. So if you swear by the king or if you swear by your mother's grave, the king and your dead mother are neither one able to know what's in your heart and to bear witness to that. Only God can do that. Second, he calls you to swear by his name because he considers it to be necessary for us to make our words certain in serious matters. And I guess I've already really said that. We need a way to make it clear in this careless world where we say things that we really don't mean, we have to make it clear when it is some very important matter that we're careful, careful about what we're saying and that we're asking God to hold us to the truth of it. We're solemnly telling the truth before God. Nevertheless, while we're commanded to take oaths in his name, Jesus tells us to be very careful about flippantly using vows, carelessly making vows in everyday affairs. For example, it profanes God's name for you to swear. Um, maybe you're, you're a tradesman, you know, and you're, working, you're, you're scheduled to work for someone, you didn't show up, and uh, they, they call you, and, oh yeah, sorry, I got tied up. And then I'll, I'll, come, uh, I'll come tomorrow. And then you don't come tomorrow. And then when they call again, you say, you know, I, I swear, I swear this time, I'm gonna come. Like, that's profaning God's name. You're using his name in vain. Um, God's name is sacred. It's not to be used in common things like that. Jesus says to let your yes be yes and your no, no in everyday affairs. The reason that you have to say that in that situation, or you feel like you have to, is because you are unreliable in your everyday work. So now you have to embellish it. Let's, let's put a little vow on it here. Let's put a little oath on it. That kind, the, the kind of occasions in which you ought to swear by God include marriage. If you're going to have sexual relations with someone, God wants you to swear that you will be committed to love that person for life before him and before witnesses. Malachi and Proverbs both refer to marriage as a covenant of companionship that you make before God. Covenants require vows before God. And if you're accusing another member of the human race in a court of law, or if you're defending them or defending yourself, it is proper for you to take God as your witness that you are telling the truth. Even Jesus did this when he was before the Jewish Supreme Court at his trial. As recorded in Matthew 26, 62 through 64, the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? Because they were throwing out all these crazy accusations and Jesus didn't even answer. He says, what is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And then Jesus answered. He did it when he was put under oath. He answered. Verse 64, Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And you remember that as you said statement means that, yeah, this is true, but it also means that I... Uh, you don't really understand what you're saying either. <laughs> you know, the words you say are true, but you're, you're not really getting it here. And then he explains, like, you're going to see me in the place of Almighty God judging the, the world in the clouds, from the clouds, the place where God, God alone is seen to judge. Okay, but the vow part. So, so oaths are used to properly to refer to matters of great importance. You can find examples of Jesus and Paul using oaths too. Um, examples like this for in Romans on chapter nine, verse one, Paul says, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel. I'm sorry, <laughs> I thought I had the reference wrong. I was thinking of another passage. It, the reference was correct in my notes. It's uh, Romans 1, nine. 
Paul says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. So there he's, he's actually solemnly affirming that he prays for them. And you have the examples of Abraham and Isaac and many others making covenants with people in the Old Testament where they took vows. There are other solemn occasions as well, such as vows of office in the church and state, vows of allegiance for a soldier, vows of membership in the church. God has always had his people enter into covenant with him when they become his people. There are a number of occasions where you would use a vow properly. But the main point is that you profane God's name and abuse it if you, in taking vows, you, uh, you associate his name with a falsehood or in a wrong way. You actually claim that God affirms your lie then. That's a terrible thing to do. You drag God's name into your lie when you swear falsely by his name. It's a serious offense of his name and he does not take it lightly. We will look more at how he judges this sin next week with question 56. But now let's move on to our third way that the, the third commandment is often broken. So far we have seen that we must not say that God has said things that he did not say. And we've seen that you must not swear falsely in his name. Third, you must not profane his name by misrepresenting his attributes. Now, you have surely experienced this. Your attributes are characteristics of, about you. It can be things like being tall or being strong or that you are merciful and kind. But it is a hurtful thing when someone misrepresents you. Perhaps you're trying out for a team and they don't want you to get on, so they spread the rumor that you're very sickly when, in fact, you're strong and healthy. And so then you don't get on the team because this person said, oh, you get, if you get him on the team, you get sick all the time. He won't be able to be at half the games. Or maybe they are jealous of you because you're getting praise from others for being kind and merciful. So this person begins to spread the lie that you're not really that way, that you befriend people in order to stab them in the back in the end. And then people don't trust you. Perhaps because of their envy, you see, they, they, they have maybe even come to believe that's true. When people are bitter and envious, they start looking and they say, well, he can't, he's not really sincere and all of that. And then they start to attribute things to you. And it's very wicked. Now, you, so that, that's where you're abusing someone's name. Again, we've seen the power that you have when you take someone's name. And, and, and similar things with God's name. God's name is abused and profane in this way all the time. God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being but there are people who say he doesn't exist. That's the ultimate denial of his attribute is the only one who exists in himself. Everything else is created. He is the only one who is uncreated. False religions also distort God's attributes. Some of them take, make God out to be impersonal. He's just a force, just a power that you can tap into. Let's go and get in touch with the spiritual strength, you know, and like that, that kind of, a, you know, new age thing. Or, or others that, that God is cruel and harsh. Some, some false religions have that of God. That he's manipulative and unkind. A God who will not forgive, maybe. I, I remember uh, talking to a fellow who was a Muslim, and he had, he had spoken, you know, so hard against adultery, and he knew how wrong it was. I'd been ministering to him with the gospel. and This guy fell into adultery. And he didn't know how Allah could ever forgive him because adultery was a big thing. You could like kind of sleep around with unmarried women, but if you had adultery with a, a woman that was married, it was a huge offense and he, there was no way of forgiveness. So it, it misrepresented God because he is a forgiving God. See, it can go all different directions. There are false religions that deny that God is truly holy. You know, really, that's the real difference between true religion, the one true religion, all false religions. None of the false religions take our sins seriously before him as something that he absolutely cannot accept in his presence. You say, well, you just said that the Islam, you know, that they, they were, he was afraid that there wouldn't be any forgiveness. And yeah, but this guy was saying that he was acceptable to God apart from the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ 
if he hadn't committed adultery, or maybe acceptable. They don't know for sure how, what, what Allah's going to do with him. So, so that's profaning God's name to say he's not holy. He's so holy that even if you were three times better than you've been all your life, you still wouldn't be acceptable to God. You have to have the atonement of Jesus Christ. And then there are those who deny his forgiveness, but, that, but, do, not, but do not acknowledge that we need forgiveness every day. They only deny it for certain sins. And often the punishment for the big sins that are not forgiven in their view of things, are punishments that don't put them in hell. Only the true faith that God revealed teaches that sin can only be pardoned through the suffering and death of God's Son in our place. It's the only one that teaches that God is truly holy. And in so doing, it reveals the fullness of God's love, mercy, justice, wrath, truth, grace, wisdom, and so forth. We talked about that this morning. You come, when you come to Christ, you're drawn to him and you run after him. And when we're converted, he brings us into the holy of holies where we see all that he is through the cross. But Christians are not free from the sin of abusing God's attributes either. Remember that the commandments are written, actually, to us as God's redeemed people. That's why it says in the very commandment itself, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Because Christians do that. God's people do that. Very often there are things that we have trouble accepting. Perhaps you have trouble accepting his forgiveness and live with guilt. Or perhaps you have trouble forgiving others. Or maybe you have trouble with holiness, the holiness I was speaking about before, that no one can come to God and be accepted of him apart from Christ. It's hard for you to think of God punishing sinners. You know it's true and you've accepted it, but you have a hard time with it. You're taking, you're saying, I, I can't really think that God is holy like it says in the word. I, I'm not, I mean, I know it's true, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not good with it. Uh, we, we, we can, uh, we, we take the edge off of things. We, we deny certain things about God, that he's not entirely sovereign, for example. Well, well God couldn't have been sovereign over that. That, that kind of thing, we, we take his name in vain. A related way that we abuse God's attributes is by attributing to other things the attributes that belong to God alone. For example, you have people who believe their destiny lies in the placement of the stars. So they read their horoscope as if the stars are in charge of their future instead of God. That's profaning the name of God. To take away sovereignty from God and to put it somewhere else. And here's a common one. It's so easy for us to trust in means instead of in God who alone controls the outcome of the means that we use. The psalmist refers to this problem when he says in Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. That means that some people find their security in the military might. And in the end, it is, but in the end, it's only the Lord that keeps us safe. We can look to government to take care of us and solve our problems. But unless God upholds the government, our government will utterly fail. You profane God's name when you ascribe to means what belongs to God. Now, of course, we should use means, but we should not trust in them. What about Asa? Do you remember him? He became diseased in his feet, 2 Chronicles 16, 12. And what did he do? He did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. It's fine to go to the doctor to use the means, but it's wicked to look to the doctors without looking to God, who sometimes uses physicians, sometimes doesn't. The Bible praises those who bind up wounds and pour oil upon them as medicine, but what is condemned is reliance upon these apart from God, who makes those means effective. People end up giving praise and thanks to the physician, and they forget God when they get better. And we can even fall into the error of trusting in the means of grace of all things. God uses his word in our prayers to help us to know him as our Lord and Savior and to grow in our walk with him. But these means are of no use unless God blesses them with his spirit. A person can wrongly suppose that he or she reads the Bible and prays every day, so all is well with my soul. I've talked to some older people sometimes, it seems like especially that 
I read my Bible every day and I pray. And, you know, they go on like that and they feel that, you know, they're totally right with God. And you start talking to them about Jesus and they don't really know. They don't really know him. They don't, they're not trusting him for their salvation. You, you can read the Bible every day. You can pray every day and never connect with God, the true God, in a saving way. You don't trust in the means. You have to trust in God. The Bible leads you to trust in the God who is true when you follow it. Some people trust in the church and her ministers. God has given us the church. He uses it in our lives. But the role of the church and her ministers is to point us to Christ, not to take his place. As if the church was the one that saves us. It's not a priest mumbling a a ritual prayer or something that saves you. It's Christ who is in heaven. So you see how we profane God's name when we either distort his attributes or when we ascribe to them those things that are not of God. Fourth, you must not profane or abuse God's name by unworthy worship. Now, I've mentioned this problem already when we looked at what is required, but it's such a common one. One of the greatest ways that we profane and abuse his name is when we take his name in vain in worship. When in the very time that we're singing his praise and hearing his word, we're not regarding him. Maybe we're not even thinking about him at all. This is a sin of the heart. Nobody can see it except God. There we are standing before him, praying, praising, hearing his word, and our hearts are far away. The Lord said, these people, Matthew 15, 8, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. This is what Jesus was talking about in the scripture reading when he describes the scribes and Pharisees is doing all sorts of religious things, but without a heart for God. He accused them of doing their religious services with a heart for man, so to speak, a desire to be seen and honored by men. The solution is not to stop your religious service, is it? The solution is to start doing it for God, not take his name in vain. We all fall into this sin in varying degrees, but some people who worship, who worship with us have never had a heart for God. Never, never ever, because they're not converted. They're just going through the motions. They will be found out and exposed, if not in this life, in the judgment. Sometimes you have somebody that comes and they go through all the motions. So, oh, you know, what a fine Christian. And we should say that. We should give them the benefit of the doubt. But then one day, oh, how could, how could they do that? How could they turn away from God? How could they go away and not even come back? Well, a lot of times they were never converted. Jesus will say to those who spent their days in outward service and it was never found out, depart from me for I never knew you. I urge you then to check your heart. No one on earth will call you out on this sin because they can't see it. You can live your whole life as a religious hypocrite, deceiving everyone. That's why it's so, such a dangerous sin. That's why I would warn you about this sin. Perhaps the Holy Spirit will be merciful if it is true of you, and perhaps he will call you to repentance. Maybe even right now. You need to say, yeah, I, I've just been playing games. I didn't. I didn't I don't even mean any of this stuff. Repent. You can be forgiven right now. Come to Christ. My preaching is nothing. It is Christ who must speak to you through words that I proclaim in his name. Don't respond to me. Respond to him. If you're bored at church, it's because you're not hearing the Lord. You can't be bored when you hear the voice of the Lord. It gets hold of you. Of course, we also profane and abuse God's name and worship when we violate the second commandment. You remember that we violate the second commandment when we approach God in worship in ways that he has not commanded. When you do that, you misrepresent him, and that's an abuse and profaning of his name, not just in your heart, but also with your words and your actions. So this is a place where there's an overlap in the commandments. It is possible to outwardly keep the second commandment while completely breaking the third, but it is not possible to keep the third commandment when you're breaking the second. Understand the distinction? You can do all the right things according to the second commandment outwardly and completely break the third commandment, but if you break the second commandment, you're also taking God's name in vain every time. If you present to God a musical performance when he calls for simple praise from your lips, you're abusing his name. 
If you bow to an image of Jesus or Mary, no matter how sincere you may be, you're abusing God's holy name who commands us not to worship by images. For more about this, you can review the second commandment, but you get the idea. Now let's wrap this up. I hope that after today's sermon, you not only have a clear idea of what the third commandment prohibits, but that you also are moved to turn from your sins against the third commandment. It's one thing to know what it prohibits. It's another thing to actually turn from those sins, that you see your need to repent and to turn to Jesus for grace and forgiveness. Because there's, every one of us transgresses this commandment. And that's why we constantly need the blood of Jesus to forgive us from our, for our sin. And there may even be someone here among us today who violates this commandment, as I said earlier, in a way that excludes them from salvation to God. Because if, if Jesus Christ, you, you say his name on your lips and that you're trusting in him, and there's no such trust, then you're taking God's name in a, a way that is fatal. That, that will bring eternal condemnation if you don't repent. You can, you can come before the elders and you can confess that you're a sinner and you can, that you can't save yourself and that you're trusting in Jesus alone for salvation. You can say all that. But when you did that, your heart was not in it. You didn't really believe it. Then you took God's name in vain. Let me tell you, if that's true of you and these words are convicting you, then don't fight against the Holy Spirit. Repent. Come to Jesus by not just profession, but in heart. I plead with you. Come to Jesus in truth and you will be completely pardoned. He never rejects anyone who comes to him in truth. You'll be pardoned even for years of hypocrisy if necessary. The Lord is a merciful, welcoming God. And it is he who calls you. And it is he who pleads with you tenderly, lovingly. He calls us to come to him. Come unto me and be saved, he says, all you ends of the earth. Please stand and let's call on his name. Merciful and gracious Father in heaven, we do praise you that you are a God of tender mercy and grace. For Lord, after hearing about the third commandment, it's true, Lord, that there's not a one of us that has not profaned your holy name and that does not do it every day. We never regard you with the reverence that is due to you as long as we're in these sinful bodies, these, in this sinful state. Though we have been redeemed, though we have been born again and have a new nature, there is still remaining corruption in us, corruption that remains. And this particular sin is one that is never entirely eradicated in this life. Father, we pray then that you would help us to be humble and that we would realize the reason we pray and ask Jesus to, uh, to, to be with us, when we, that we come in his name when we pray and when we worship you is because if we're not in his name, we can't even come before you because we're unfit. We have to have the cleansing of his blood all the time. As it says in 1 John that if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Sometimes that's ironic sounding to people because it says, well, if they're walking in the light, why do they need to be cleansed from their sin? But that's the very thing. When we walk in the light, then we know that we come short and we know that we need to be cleansed. And it's those who walk in the light who know they need to be cleansed and who come to Jesus for cleansing. So we pray, Lord, we pray that we would we would be clear about that. It's not that we're in some state where we don't break this commandment anymore. It's rather that we're in a state where we're, we're actually not taking your name in vain because we, under, we, we see that we come short. And therefore, we call on your name in truth. Oh, Father, we pray that you would open the eyes of, of people all around us, Lord, for there's such a problem with this. And there's such a need, Lord, for, for you to to open eyes of the blind so that they will walk in the light and will have the cleansing that comes when they're not profaning your name, but walking in the light. And Father, we pray for, for our worship, Lord, that, that truly, Lord, you would help us. I know how, how terribly I take your name in vain, how often that, that I'm just not regarding you, even when we're here at church. Oh, Father, have mercy. Deliver us, Lord. Help us to 
to become more holy and to become more what you've called us to be. Thank you so much for our Lord Jesus Christ, for his forgiving grace. We pray that we would find it in all of its fullness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing and ask God to, to search us and know us and show us the wicked way is in us. In Psalm 139, may God make you worthy of his calling and may he fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.